Or if I have a little bit of honey and maybe some fruit and an avocado, and all of a sudden my carbs go up to 100, 150 grams, then I'm definitely a carb burner for that day or two. But the beautiful thing is, I'm metabolically flexible. My body knows how to move from a fat burner to a carb burner to a fat burner. So when I go back into ketosis, not having the carbohydrates, I don't have cravings. Now, in those days it, it passed, you know, I was eating pizza. I was, I mean, I was, I loved carbs. And as soon as I didn't have my carbs, I starved and had to have more carbs. There's mm -hmm. no cravings. I have no cravings. That's great. Yeah, I found the same. Uh there, there's a big difference between your carb sources and I love metabolic flexibility. Uh, I think I've been talking about it since day one, really, when I started doing all my stuff four years ago. And well, I mean, I started before that, but I started putting out content four years ago, I think. And uh, super important. And I, yeah, I've seen problems when people just, they're just going keto for years and years at a time. And I don't think that's natural. I don't think that's what well, I don't happened, think but... it's natural. I, I, yeah. our, our ancestors didn't do it. We, we are omnivores. We are not carnivores. We are not meant to eat a carnivore diet 100% all the time. We have eaten and our guts are designed for some plant matter, but not plant matter in large proportions and certainly not plant matter that have anti-nutrients that damage our gut. It's a great little wrap up there. I love it. We're really on the same page. It's, yeah, I mean, sapien diet. I'm trying to just say what people are already doing. You know, I just don't like the word carnivore. I don't associate myself or identify as a carnivore. I mean, to me, that's just an unnatural diet that maybe people can use it for a short time. And I don't, I don't know. I just don't like people going around. So, oh, carnivore. I'm carnivore. This is the carnivore. It's like, no, we, we humans are omnivores. We, subsist on all types of food all over the world and if you're doing it correctly in my book it's called sapien where yes you are eating like you said 80 to 90 percent of your foods are from animal foods and you have key low anti-nutrient plant foods and you can cycle it in you can eat seasonally you can mix it up and and everything seems to work <laughs> eat human les humains à leur meilleur Hey, 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 everyone. We're back with Peak Cuban. This is Brian Sanders. Got another great episode for you. Always remember, share with the friends, give the podcast a review on iTunes or the podcast app, and start back at episode one. These episodes are evergreen. The information's always good. It really holds up. My first episode even holds up three and a half years ago. I've been banging the same drum the whole time. So today we have Dr. Al Dannenberg. He's really great. He is beating cancer actively. He got a terminal sentence. He had a few months to live and it's been years. He's been doing great. He's been eating a sapien diet. He's all into the ancestral lifestyle. We really agree on a lot of things. A lot of great new information here as well. New stuff about getting actual hydration from water and not just chugging water. That's not what hydration is about. It's actually getting minerals and the correct things in the water to hydrate your body. We talk about dental health health and how it all starts with diet. Another one of my favorite topics, going back to the Weston Price stuff, talk a lot about the different versions of animal-based diets, ancestral diets, sapien stuff. Such a good one. Before we get into it, just a few updates. I have the Freely Network launch. This is something we're doing with some people who enjoy free speech. They enjoy free living. I'm out here in Texas doing all of that. We had a great event a few weeks ago, the Immune System Awareness Rally with JP Sears and Zuby. Such a smash hit. Seriously, the best event of the year. Many people told me this was the best event of the year. Not joking. Very many people said that. It was spectacular. We're going to try to have another one. 600 person venue. We decided we needed a network for everyone to stay in touch, to talk about things without censorship. So we have it. Freelynetwork.com. F-R-E-E-L-Y network.com. Check it out. It's a private community. It's member supported. Everyone puts in less than $1.50 a month. Small cost to run the whole thing. So we don't have to rely on Facebook, Instagram, 
them or anyone else. You are the business model in those networks. Your information is being sold. You are being sold to the advertiser. You are at the risk of censorship. It's all a mess. Instead, we have a simple business model. People pay about $1.33 per month, $16 a year, and we keep this thing going on our own. We have all different topic categories where we can discuss things that are censored on other networks. It's all a private members area. We can direct message each other. We can plan the next event. We can make this go worldwide. We can have events in other states, other cities. I'm going back to LA October 22nd through 25th. We'll have an event in LA. Contact me if you want to be part of the immune system awareness event in LA that weekend. So much going on on the Freely Network. We're just getting it going. Be part of the founding members, freelynetwork.com. Super exciting stuff. We're getting the speakers from the event involved. This is needed for our future. So enough about that. We also got the newsletter at sapien.org. That's where the uncensored content is. Not that it's anything controversial, really. We're just sending out great content that we find around the web, content that we produce each week, new articles, stuff like that. So join the newsletter, sapien.org. You can find the program there as well. The Tribe, another private community. And of course, knowsthetail.org. Knows the Tales, where we have all the great regenerative products. Meat, primal ground beef, the biltong. Man, that's some great stuff. Protein, super easy. You need it fast. You don't have time to cook a steak. Grab a bag of biltong or the drovors, which is a stick version. Some people like the stick version better. It's called drovors with a W. It's a traditional South African treat. Air dried, no sugar, all the good stuff. Selling out of the soap. We had new soap come in stock. Might be sold out by the time you're hearing this. Few ingredients. Only thing I use. Nosetail.org. We got you. So Dr. Al Dannenberg or Dr. Al as he's known by his friends, patients, and community consults with patients all over the world virtually via Zoom or Skype regarding animal-based nutrition, lifestyle, oral, and overall health. The importance of a healthy gut and immune system. After a terminal cancer diagnosis, Dr. Al developed a plan that evolved into his unconventional cancer protocols, combining in-depth research of ancestral nutrition and lifestyle changes with his knowledge from 44 years as a periodontist. Now he focuses on helping others like you regain control of your health. It's an inspiring story. He's doing well. He's living strong. Listen to this one. I know you'll enjoy it. Thanks, everyone. Hey, we're live with Dr. Al Dannenberg. How's it going? Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity, Brian. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We had a good chance to talk already last week. Got to know you a little bit. Got to know your story. Uh, you also featured my my presentation on your blog, which was great. First of all, your presentation was awesome. And you're not paying for me, paying me for to say this. It was awesome. Thank you. It was nice to yeah. come across it. Yes. It's the 15 minute presentation. It's called the whole the history of I forget what I even call it. Why we should be eating more meat, not less. The whole story in 15 minutes. It's my presentation from the food industry conference I spoke at almost two years ago now. Ivor Cummins actually reposted it on his YouTube, so it's gotten a lot more momentum lately. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have found out about it. And so that's cool. And uh, yeah, you, you made it into a little article and wrote some supplementary information about it. But I think it's, it's a good message that people need to hear because well, people are scared to eat meat, you know? Yeah, well, they're, they're scared because they're inundated with a lot of junk fake news, which unfortunately is permeating the world today and in a lot of other areas too. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And well, I'm here to debunk them, debunk the lies. That's why I'm called food lies. And sometimes it kind of stretches into healthcare lies and, you know, media Without lies. Doubt. Without a doubt. Right? Media lies. So I'm trying to stick to, you know, stick to my kind of bread and butter, which is avoiding the bread. No, it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I stick to my good, good, good one-liner, good one-liner. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not plan it. it. It was okay. But let's get into your story. Okay. Let's get into your story because, you know, you had a pretty amazing tale. So I'd like to hear it. Yeah. So first of all, I'm 74 years old. So my tale really can go way, way back. I don't know where you want me to start. Um First of all, a periodontist, been in practice for 44 years. That means I am a dentist with a specialty of, uh, in periodontal treatment where I treat gum disease and the variety of issues that manifest from gum disease that go under the gum, do all kinds of terrible things. And, I, and like I said, I was doing it for 44 years. 
So at the age of 59, I can tell you that I'm thinking I'm a healthy guy and I have a stroke at the age of 59. And my docs um, saved my life and they put me on seven medications for the rest of my life. And I'm telling them or asking them what's going on, why did I have a stroke? They had no idea. They said, eat healthy and exercise healthy. And who knows what that means, right? So th they had no more. idea. Exercise more? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, so they had no idea. So from the age of 59 to 66, I did what I would consider research. Now I'm a healthcare professional, so I, I think I should know something and so I look at the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the Cancer Society, all these organizations that theoretically support their members and patients to get a healthier body and lifestyle. It's, unfortunately, unknowingly, their information is totally incorrect. But I'm mm -hmm. following this information from the age of 59 to 66. I, I, I was a little chunky. I'm, I'm short. I'm 5'7", but I was weighing about 187 pounds. I lost maybe three or four pounds. I was still on seven medications during this period from six, uh, 59 to 66. Then I discover a course, a five-day course, that is on nutrition for the healthcare professional. It's at the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health of all places. So I go to that thinking that this is going to be the ideal way for me to learn not only good nutrition, but hopefully support everything I was doing, because I still thought I was doing things correctly. Um, losing a few pounds of weight, still being on medication. The course was actually on paleo lifestyle and diet, terms mm. that I never learned about prior to this. So it made such sense to me that when the course was over, five days were done, I came home and called my wife first. I said, um, let's make some changes. Well, you know, there are a lot of changes to be made. So my wife and I bumped heads for a while, and she said, I'll give you 30 days. So what we did was eliminate all of the junk food that I was eating that was not paleo-like, and from the freezer and the pantry and the refrigerator, we had seven grocery bags of food that we took to the food bank, and we had no food in the house. So we started to learn how to eat and shop organic and, and, and basically paleo. From the age of 66 to 68, I changed my entire life. I lost over 35 pounds without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I got off all seven medications, not because I threw them away. It's just I didn't need them anymore. And mm -hmm. the amazing thing is none of my medical doctors knew anything um, that was going on. They said, you know, they wanted me to be on this medicine and that medicine, but here I'm getting healthier and healthier, and they couldn't figure out why, and I did figure out why. So those two years really taught me a lot. And I started to incorporate the concepts of a paleo lifestyle and diet with my periodontal treatment for my patients. And those patients that really got excited about what I was doing had phenomenal results. Now, mind you, I'm a conventional periodontist, theoretically, although I'm leaning toward a healthier way of living. Most of my patients are looking for treatment for gum disease. So when I start to talk about nutrition, they get turned off. But maybe 5% were impressed. And those 5% really made a difference in their life and their healing. And I could treat actual gum inflammation, not the more severe gum disease, but gum inflammation by just changing diet. No active period periodontal treatment whatsoever. So everybody was impressed and I started to write and I started to lecture and I'm going around the country talking about this nutritional concept with periodontal disease. So in April of 2018, I'm asked to speak at the Paleo FX meeting in April in Austin where you guys are. And so I travel. So when I travel from Charleston, South Carolina to any place, there's no really direct flights for most uh, destinations, so I have to go through Atlanta Airport. And while I'm getting into Atlanta Airport, it's a big airport, and I try to walk the concourses, which are very long, 
unless I have a tight schedule. So I have a, a, a very loose schedule. I take my bag that I carry on my shoulder and I'm walking. And all of a sudden, I start to develop pain in my right shoulder. And that pain doesn't go away. And that's very unusual. So I get to Austin, I do my speech, I get home, the pain in the right shoulder never goes away completely, but it starts to linger and, 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 and um, isolate itself to my back. And then it comes to my front sternum area, and I start to have difficulty breathing. I'm getting a little concerned. So I'm kind of pig-headed, therefore, um, I hadn't seen my physician from April of 2018, until August of 2018, when my problems got a little more severe, and my doc says, well, let's do some blood tests. Let's see what's going on. And he does the basic blood work that comes back normal, and he does a CRP, C-reactive protein, which explains maybe systemic inflammation, but it doesn't say where it's coming from, and it doesn't say if it's acute or chronic. But my, my CRP is extremely high. Generally, it's very, very normal. He says, let's do an MRI just to figure out what's going on with this inflammation. And he does an MRI, and he calls me on the phone, and he says, do you want to come in the office or do you want to talk? And this is the guy that has been my physician for decades, and he treated my, my stroke. And so I said, Bobby, just talk to me. So at first he starts to kid around. He says, did somebody beat you up or did you fall down some steps? And I said, of course not. I was carrying a bag and I must have torn a ligament or ruptured something in my shoulder. And he says, well, the MRI suggests that you have either lymphoma, leukemia, or multiple myeloma. Mm. Wait a minute. These are three malignancies. How can a guy, at this point, I'm 71 years old, how can a guy who thinks he is the poster boy for senior citizens have cancer, especially since I've been eating healthy for six years or so, uh, at least I think. So it's devastating news. And he refers me to an oncologist. I get a bunch of other tests. And I'm diagnosed with a incurable bone marrow cancer, um, which is called IgA kappa light chain multiple myeloma, incurable. And I'm given three to six months to live. That's wow. September of 2018. Devastating, obviously. My wife and two adult kids are in the um, um, doctor's office while I'm learning this information. And my physician wants me, my oncologist wants me to start chemotherapy immediately, the next day, theoretically. And I say, well, wait a minute. If my disease is not treatable, why am I doing chemotherapy? And he says, well, chemotherapy will put you in remission. And if you're in remission, um, you'll feel better and you can live longer. And I said, well, if it's not curable, what, what do you mean I can live longer? And he said, well... You will go out of remission and you'll have to have more chemo to go back into remission. And then the chemo that we did before would not be affected. We need more caustic chemicals to keep you in remission. And I said, well, my only concern is my quality of life. And he said, of course, your quality of life is going to go downhill until none of the chemo works. And I was not a good candidate for stem cell therapy for a variety of reasons. So I said, well, if this is going to happen and I'm going to decrease the quality of my life and take these drugs, how am I going to die? This is, these are geeky questions, but I needed to know the answers. And he said, well, most multiple myeloma patients will die from the manifestations, complications of multiple myeloma. I will either bleed to death because I would be so severely anemic because the red blood cells would just get pushed out by all the malignant plasma cells in my bone marrow, or my resistance to infection would be so severe, severely compromised that a simple cold would turn into pneumonia and eventually no antibiotic would work and I would die from infection, or I would have kidney failure. None of this is a pleasing thought. Mm. So I'm thinking, I'm trying to be logical, and I'm thinking, 
what I need to do is to rebuild my immune system if I can, and certainly not destroy it through chemotherapy, especially since it's not going to work long term, and I'm only going to decrease the quality of my life. So I create these 10 unconventional cancer protocols. Uh, we can go into that in detail. And I do very well, as a matter of fact. From August of September 2018 to, to August of 2019, long after my prognosis suggested I would die, I'm doing well. Except August of 2019, because of my disease, I have lots of holes in my bone because of this, um, these path, the, the damage to the bone structure from the pathology of the, my disease. So I know I can be prone to pathological fractures, meaning a bone will break on its own with little pressure. So I'm standing in my bathroom, brushing and flossing my teeth, August 2019. And I'm standing on, obviously, with my feet on the floor, and I take the dental floss that I'm used to throw it away. Now, my trash can is to my left, so I twist to my left, and as I twist to my left, my right femur snaps in half. Mm. I crash to the floor, break two more ribs, and I also break my humerus in half. Ouch. I am writhing in pain. I know how badly I damaged the major bones on my right side because my limbs are in positions that I could never bend them. I'm screaming for my wife who's in the other room. She comes, lots of emotion here, obviously. She calls EMS, emergency services. They get me to the hospital. They fix my right leg because I'm going to bleed out from my femoral artery. Uh, they don't fix my arm and I'm ready to die, and I want to die, and I've l l lived longer than my prognosis, and I cannot believe any quality of life could come from that point. So I go into hospice, and I am literally ready to die. I am catheterized, I am highly drugged with narcotics, I am bedridden, I am constipated. I mean, it is terrible. And then all of a sudden, a hurricane of all things called Hurricane Durian is going to hit Charleston in September, the first week of September, and it's going to strike near the hospital, and the hospital is ordered to evacuate all of its patients. My wife's an RN. She arranges for a hospital bed at home, and they send me home, and my wife gives me some top of love, and she says, look, you've done so well in, on these unconventional cancer protocols. Let's get you back on those. Let me get a physical therapist in the house, and let's see what we can do. So the physical therapist comes in, and all of a sudden, I start to recover. And within two weeks, I revoke hospice. I can get out of bed in a walker. I get the catheter out. I'm starting to be, become a healthier person, and I revoke hospice. And I see my oncologist the next month, October 2019, who says um, he can't believe I'm alive. Well, things happen. And I start to investigate, because of my cancer protocols, a more therapeutic diet for cancer. And it is a carnivore diet, basically the food diet that is used by the Paleo Medicina Clinic in Budapest, Hungary, that literally treats severe chronic disease and cancer patients with a strict animal-based diet, no supplements, no prescription drugs. They've treated over 5,000 patients for the last 10 years. And I start to incorporate this carnivore diet as of January 1st, 2020 in my 10 protocols. Can I jump in? Because I've had Dr. Zofia Clemens on, yes. who's part of the, the main doctors at Paleo yes. Medicina. So you can look back at that Peak Human podcast episode. Also, before we go on, I'm curious what you're eating at the hospice and how that changed when you left and you got <laughs> back home. Hospital food, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting. It was very interesting. I was able to talk to, this is a small hospice hospital. And I was able to talk to the chef of the hospital, and I told him, excuse me, 
I told him that I did not want to eat gluten foods. So he prepared the foods with no sugars and no grain products, mm -hmm. which was very interesting. So he, it was as close to paleo as I could get in a hospital environment, but hospital food should not be fed to anybody, certainly <laughs> not unhealthy people. It is amazing, right? It's so, so sad, but it, maybe just give us a quick idea. Cause yes, I mean, that's good to get out the sugar and grains, but I'm guessing it still wasn't anywhere close to what you switched to with like sort of an animal. Oh no, diet. of course not. I mean, I, I had eggs quite a bit. They would, mm -hmm. they would, um, they would actually serve me burgers, but, um, uh, without a bun. So th they made burgers, they mm -hmm. had onions and tomatoes and, foods like that, vegetables and, and fruits that they had. But fortunately, it was not the, the, the major elements. I asked them not to prepare anything other, uh, with any vegetable or seed oils, could just cook mm. everything in butter. And I That's believe good. that they did, at least they said they would do that. And again, it was a very small hospice hospital, maybe 20, 30 hospice patients in this facility. So the chef was very accommodating and I appreciated it. Well, that's great. That's great because people have more control than they think maybe when, if you just really stand up for yourself and say, this oh, is agree. what I need, this I is agree. what I need. I, I can't have, you can pretend you're gluten-free. No one's going to call you on it. Say, and I, I had this idea when I was talking to Dr. Kate Shanahan, just say you're seed oil intolerant. If you oh, just yes. say, Seed oil yes. intolerant, which is like, I can't do it. You know, actually Stan Efferding, I interviewed him. He actually is seed oil intolerant. And so if you just say that, just be like, I can't do it. And then they'll have to comply. The, the saddest part is if you're in a hospital environment and you're on feeding tubes or something that they're putting into your body that you're not eating, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the formulas of this, these um, food stuffs that are li liquefied, is just garbage. I mean, it is garbage. And I don't know that you can ask and tell somebody to change it because I don't know that there are good options out there in a hospital environment. They'll just feed this crap to you. Yeah, we talked about that with Stan too, the total parental nutrition and and it, it has warning labels on it that it, it causes severe, um, what is it? Kid, uh, is it kidney down? Oh, fatty liver and oh, yeah, it has some other sure. problems. Yeah. yeah, and it's just proven to just kill animals. And they, but if the situation is so extreme, they have to use it for short periods of time in the hospital. But I think they are looking to alternatives and using different things. But anyway, so you get on the paleo medicina diet. How long did you do that protocol? So I was very strict. You know, they, they call it the paleolithic ketogenic diet. I was very strict with that for a approximately a year and then i started to introduce a few fruits very very few vegetables no nuts and seeds basically foods that were uh, or um, plants that were low in phytates oxalates and lectins uh, maybe 90 percent of my plate of food was animal based and 10 percent were uh, a few of the vegetables or fruits that fit the category. Yeah. This is the sapien diet. This is amazing. Yeah, this is exactly what a lot of people are landing on. Even even like Paul Saladino, and he was like, all oh, carnivore, you got to do carnivore. And now he's like, oh, well, what about uh, just adding some fruits and honey I and know. maybe some uh, I know. the least toxic plant foods? So I I, know I just want to say, I've been, I've been talking about this the whole time. <laughs> This is like, this is where it's at. This is where, this is what makes sense. This is doable. This is enjoyable. This is, uh, well, I agree. As a matter of fact, when Paul introduced, um, interviewed me with my cancer protocol and the carnivore diet, um, we talked about honey because I am a big proponent of honey because I've even written several papers about honey and the healthy benefits in the mouth. You can even use honey to brush your teeth. And there are great papers that support that because it reduces the kind of pathogenic bacteria that cause tooth decay and gum disease of all things. Um, mm -hmm. There's over 200 biologically active chemicals in honey, honey and especially manuka. So I love it. So 
I, I was doing that and, and I was getting the results. And as a matter of fact, May of 2020, I had a PET scan. Now, a PET scan is a CT scan, big X-ray from head to the toe, and you're injected with radioactive glucose so that um, the glucose gets gobbled up by cancer cells that there are in, in the body, and it shows on the X-ray so they can identify where these cancer cells are. And it was the first PET scan I have ever had that mm. was negative no active cancer cells in my body. Now, unfortunately, PET scans only show moderate to advanced stages of cancer, so early floating cancer cells are not really going to be picked up, and I am not in remission, but I feel fantastic. I love that. Yeah, you look great. I, I'm, I know you have you know, lots of energy. You're out there doing so many things, and it's been three years. So yeah, this is, three years. This is great, and I also want to touch on you mentioned you were doing all the right things. You've been eating well for six years. But the way I understand multiple myelomas, they, it's not like they just popped up in the last six years. This is probably from decades ago. Yeah. So I, I do a lot of research and try to figure out what's happening in a variety of things that I talk about and write about. So obviously, if I have multiple myeloma, I need to figure out why I have it. Uh, mm -hmm. There were a, a bunch of people that were mocking me, actually, that said, how healthy of a diet could it be? You got multiple myeloma. And they mm -hmm. just didn't understand. But the research is very interesting. I think a paper was published, I'm thinking 2010, 2012, in Brazil, of all places. And, and the researchers were looking at data, cohorts of people. They looked at male... Um, individuals my age group 65 to 75 compared to the male population and they were looking at male dentists mm -hmm. compared to the entire male population and the male dentists at that age group had a significant higher prevalence of cancer especially multiple myeloma now the paper didn't go into why that was occurring it was just observational so I, I tried to figure out what happened as a dentist that was so different in my life and other dentists of my age compared to the male population my age group. Mm -hmm. And in dental school, there are two very significant things that are highly toxic and caustic to the body that are known now, weren't known then. And they were um, low-dose ionizing radiation, which are dental x-rays, and free amalgam, mercury, uh, I mean, mer free, mer mer free mercury. Mercury is used in silver fillings um, called um, silver fillings or mercury fillings, dental amalgams. They're all the same thing. And w we played with free mercury, mercury in our hands like kids play with Play-Doh. And if you know much about mercury, it's quite a an exciting metal. It's liquid, and it rolls, and it's beautiful, and it it's silvery. And, and it, not only you can play it with your hands, you can throw it on the floor, and the beads kind of run around, and all of a sudden they disappear. Mm. And this is what we did in the dental clinics. And the dental clinics all over the country were basically the same in those days. And that mercury literally evaporated into the atmosphere of the dental school. And the dental schools were probably the most toxic physical structures in the country. Uh, wow. So I, we're getting, I was getting overdosed with mercury and possibly overdose with low, low um, dose ionizing radiation from dental x-rays because in our clinic, there are many, many dental x-ray machines that were shared by all the dental students and you're walking back and forth in the clinic. You don't know when an x-ray is being used except you see a light that turns on and off. It's not a, a sound or a warning of any way that you can be aware of. So it only takes one malignant plasma cell, one, one cell that becomes cancerous to then become malignant, spread throughout the body, and then duplicate itself so many times to become a trillion cells that cause a disease. And I think that that's the start of my disease. 
Well, it makes a lot of sense. And we're talking how, what year, what year were you in medical school? Yeah. So that would be 1972. I got mm -hmm. out of school in 72, three years, so, four years of dental yeah. school, two years of graduate school, a long time ago. So it makes sense. You playing with mercury, it's all fun and games until you get cancer. It, yeah. We didn't know as much right. back then. They were using those in people's mouths too, right? So now I know that they get rid of a lot of these fillings and they don't use, I mean, the good people who know what they're doing don't use any metal fillings. They use but, the. But, but that's true for only the dentists that get educated after school. Exactly. I will tell you right now the dental schools around the country still teach mercury fillings for students. They have to do them to get out of dental school. The FDA, this year is the first year that ever for the FDA to say, well, maybe mercury fillings are not so good if you're pregnant or you're young. But all until this year, the FDA has said that there are no problems with mercury fillings. There's never been proof that it causes chronic disease. And the American Dental Association also obviously agrees. Um, this is an aside, but the American Dental Association used to own the patent on mercury filling material. Used to own the patent on oh, mercury my. filling material. Um, very similar to some of the stuff that's going on with what's happening in the world today. This is insane. There's always a conflicts of interest and people wonder yeah. why this information is still being propagated. And it's super obvious to me. And I, maybe it's just because it sounds conspiratorial if you just talk about this stuff. But then if you just look at it for more than two seconds, you realize it's not a conspiracy. It's just business and it's just how the world works and it's big organizations for I think their... it's called I think it's called money and power. Yeah, that's not a conspiracy. That's just reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there is some conspiracy stuff out there, you know, like I yeah, I, I see some like really bogus stuff going on, but there's so much real stuff. You, you just need to know, you know, what's the real stuff and then there, you know. I don't know. There's like stupid like QAnon stuff, or I don't know what it is. But there's some uh, bogus stuff. I just want to admit that. But yeah, there's so but, much but, real stuff. But sometimes when you hear fake news over and over and over again, it sounds mm -hmm. real because you hear it so much from so many different angles, and that's part of the problem. Well, that's how the media works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're inundated with the media. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, so what, what's next? So you, so we talked about why you think you got this, that makes a lot of sense. It's obviously not something that just pops up overnight. And that was because you started eating whole foods that that's not how you get cancer. You don't get cancer by losing 35 pounds, getting off all your meds, eating whole foods. You get cancer from messing around with x-rays 50 years ago when we didn't know you know, how bad they were. We didn't have all the prevention techniques and we were playing with mercury and we didn't, all that stuff. So now we kind of know why you got it. Uh, we know what you're doing to basically stay in remission, but maybe not officially. Um, what else? Well, there are elements that we need to um, effectual, e efficiently improve to recreate a robust immune system. So the bottom line is for you to be alive, for me to be alive, for me and you to function at peak performance, it is critical that our immune system function as robustly as it could. The problem is there are so many toxic elements that are getting involved with our body's metabolism, our gut microbiome, just the functionality of individual cells that any and all of these, especially if they're compounded, constantly create a dysfunctional immune system. It's like the army that we have to defend ourselves is always fighting a war. Therefore, it cannot be ready to fight the biggest war ever. So if you are in, in, inundated with little toxic elements here and there, and your body theoretically knows how to deal with that, but it's constantly dealing with that, it's just not up to par to, to get a good result from a massive insult to your body. And that could be cancer, 
actually. And the immune system not only works exogenously with things that come in from the outside, it works with things that are created endogenously into the in the body. So it affects and kills cancer cells when it sees it. And you and I, me obviously, but you too, have cancer cells all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's just that you don't get sick. You don't develop a malignancy. They don't overgrow because your immune system catches it you, you're and it catches it in a variety of ways but it literally gets to that malignant cell and it either eats it up or the cell itself that's cancerous has its own internal structure its own internal brain to mm-hmm. say okay i'm too sick to function i will kill myself off and it creates um, what's called apoptosis, it basically commits suicide. And, and that way, the body reabsorbs whatever is good in the cell and, dis- and, and dis- um, gets rid of the toxic elements, and your body goes on and, and does what it's supposed to do. But if that immune system is compromised, it can't do the job. And so I need to make my, my immune system and everybody – as healthy as possible. And the diet is one part of doing that. Yeah, I'm going to let you go on, but I just wanted to extend your analogy because I love the the soldier analogy or you, you have the analogy of this army. And the mm-hmm. immune system is super complex, but I think it's super simple. In, in my mind, there's like a threshold and you're talking about the big invader. It's it's kind of like if people are eat, constantly eating grains and seed oils and all these bad foods, their, their whole army is always involved in the civil war. So most of them, say 80% of them, whatever percent, they're just always fighting this civil war. And then you're saying when the real invader comes in, so then some other country comes in, and now we don't have enough people to fight off this big country that's invading us because we're involved in this civil war. And so people who clean up their diet, this is what happened to me. I used to have allergies. I used to get sick every few months like everyone else. I used to have all these things because I was just eating bad foods. And when I cut out those certain foods, you know, these processed foods, then I didn't have to always fight this civil war. And so then I didn't get sick anymore. And so then something could come along and the flu would come along, any other virus could come along and it would just bounce off me because I had my whole army ready to go to fight off the foreign invader. And I wasn't just screwing myself by fighting the, the civil war the whole time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you can redefine that as being what's called metabolically flexible. Your body knows how to metabolize fat. It knows how to metabolize carbohydrates. It does what it does. And that metabolism supports every cell in your body. And every cell in your body communicates with every other cell in one way or another. And we are electrical beings. So it's not like it's just the, the food, it's, it's there are frequencies that are generated by cells to communicate back and forth. Internally, the cells create chemicals that go into the blood system or lymph or whatever, even, even the myelin sheath of nerves that travels from organ system to organ system. It's a constant communication network. AT&T has nothing compared <laughs> to the communication system of our body. I love it. Well, yeah. So we need to work on our immune systems. Everyone should know this. It's very obvious. Everyone should, it should have been talked about nonstop for the past year and a half with COVID. This is all people should have been talking about. How do we improve your immune system? How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? So you talked about some of the diet stuff. What else is there? So the gut is, well, included in the diet is the water we drink because frequently people will think they're eating a healthy diet and ignore the fact that they have to drink healthy water. And I have a very personal experience that I'll share with you in a moment, but the water just can't be filtered water. If you filter the water, you're literally drinking dead water. It's not going to be effective. It's just H2O. There are elements in the water, actual trace elements the good natural spring water uh, may have anywhere above 50 trace minerals in them and there are salts that are from dehyde from uh, evaporated uh, prehistoric primal 
oceans that that literally have been helpful in regaining the trace minerals in mm -hmm. In spring water. So extremely beneficial hydrated um, uh, trace mineral water will help your body hydrate. Um, even the sun beating on the water changes the physical structure of the water. There was, I can't remember the guy, he's a um, medical doctor in Washington University that has done research on structured water because of the sun literally changing the quality of the water still h2o but mm -hmm. there's some uh, uh, specific quality that improves the hydration of the water the interesting thing is when i was diagnosed with cancer and i get blood work every four weeks i've gotten it for the last three years and it will continue mm -hmm. this way my bun blood urea nitrogen was always on the high end to over high all the time. And BUN can identify um, kidney disease, but it also can identify dehydration. So my oncologist said, Al, you're just not drinking enough water. And I said, George, I am drinking as much water as I can drink. I am drinking filtered water all the time. I didn't understand filtered water was not healthy water. So, I don't know, maybe a year ago, I started to learn about water that has trace minerals in it. And I started drinking what's called Soleil first thing in the morning. And nothing but, I, I don't drink filtered water anymore. It's just natural spring water with many, many trace minerals. But the Soleil is actually, you make it yourself, you get Himalayan crystals. Uh, rocks, you know, they, they can powder down to just, uh, you know, like a salt shaker, but the rocks themselves, you put the rocks, half of the, uh, fill a, a mason jar halfway with the rocks, put spring water in the rest, and in 24 hours, the water will literally dissolve the rocks to the point of um, saturation. So Are it's you a super rocks, saturated. Like rock salt or like you, you, even bigger. It's like almost an inch yeah, around. Well, you're not talking about just like a granite rock. You're talking about a no, no, rock no, no, salt no. crystal. Yes. Himalayan salt rock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is like, you know, Redmond or something or Redmond's or Himalayans. Yes. Either one have these crisp, huge crystals that are not processed yet to make a uh, granulated salt. Salt yeah, shaker. actually, they they sent me some. Cause I teamed up with them finally, um, but no, I love them. And we're not talking because when you say crystals and we say rocks, it sounds like kind of crazy. It's like, oh, this guy's using, using uh, crystals. Uh, uh, uh. Or, but yeah, 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 I'm just saying, no, no, no. We're talking about a you know a simple, <laughs> natural thing here. It, it's basically evaporated seawater yes. that has been two hundred thousand or older years old that have all of the natural salts of that ocean. Um, and it has gotten very hard. So when you put it in water, it dissolves to the point where the water becomes super saturated, meaning all the minerals in the crystals have dispersed into the water to the point where it can't get more minerals into the water. So it's super saturated, can't get more concentrated. And you take an, a teaspoon of that super saturated water and add it to maybe eight ounces of just natural spring water and drink it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, nothing to eat or drink for about a half hour after that. So I do it every day. So when I started that, there were anecdotal stories. This is going to help your hydration. But you know, mm -hmm. anecdotal stories mean really very little. But I did that because I'm an N equal one kind of researcher. So I did that. And then two weeks later, I was having another blood test. And the blood test, was done, my BUN dropped right in the middle of the normal range. And my oncologist said, well, finally, you're drinking more water. And I said, no, I am drinking healthier water. I'm not drinking any more. And ever since then, it's been eight months or so since then, my BUN has always been in the normal range, and it never was. And I do believe 
that is a critical element to eating a healthy diet, drinking healthy water. And I'm not thinking in terms of drinking filtered or reverse osmosis water and adding, you know, a, a few um, eye drops of synthetic minerals that are to support the water. I'm talking about the natural minerals that the water used to have. This is, and this is I great. think it's well, an amazing. Well, I, it is. If, I mean, you have the tests that prove it. And, I, you know, I yeah. know you're doing the same, you know, it's not like you were just randomly doing things. You were pretty structured the whole time and you had a lot of tests and then something switched and immediately you saw the results. So, but yeah. what about filtered water and then just adding in the salt? Like, can you start with a good filter? I know a lot of people have, you know, good filters at home that they're already using, but then yes, it is sort of dead. I think you mentioned dead water, but right. then adding, instead of adding in synthetic trace minerals, I'm saying add in the sole, you know, yes. thing to your filtered water. I'm sure the result would be good. I don't know. There are anecdotal comments that there is more electrical chemistry in water that has not been filtered and processed. Um, and I don't, I can't prove that. I think for the average person, that is a perfect way to go. But the sole water is just the first thing in the morning. As I'm drinking my water during the day, I'm drinking natural spring water. So it has the okay. natural minerals in it. So some people can't get natural spring water. I know there's services or you could pay and you know you can mm -hmm. do all this type of stuff, but I'm just wondering for people who aren't gonna go <clears throat> this extra mile to buy the really expensive spring water, if they can use the filtered water, right? Because we still want to filter out bad stuff. There's a lot of bad Absolutely. stuff in water, right? Absolutely. So no one, Absolutely. okay, so we'll get that on the table. Don't just drink regular tap water, filter it out if you're gonna have to. Uh, then maybe you could add maybe just smaller amounts of this sole stuff to your water you can drink over the day. So at least there's some minerals in it. Yeah, or or um, you probably need more trace minerals because different types of minerals. So you there are products that you can buy that are liquid sea salt that are in dropper form that you can add to normal drinking water, not to make it the concentrated sole itself. Um, that probably works too. But the, the important thing, like you just said, you don't want tap water and you don't want strictly pure filtered water or reverse osmosis water or distilled water because it literally has nothing in it. Mm -hmm. and so you have to replenish it, it, replenish it some way. Ideally, natural spring water would be good. But if you can't, then you have to replenish it in some way for your normal drinking water throughout the day, cooking water, whatever. If you're going to make bone broth, I would never use tap water. I would use spring water or reconstituted water, something like that. And then in addition, do the sole first thing in the morning because it literally gives this concentrated um, hydrating potential. And I can prove it with my blood tests. It's, it's been quite yeah. amazing. Well, you know, I think I'm actually on my way to proving it too with myself because I did a hair mineral analysis test and all my minerals were really good. You know, I'm, I'm eating my nose to tail diet and everything is looking great except for my sodium. And I, and I thought, hey, man, I'm getting a lot of sodium. You know, I'm putting my good Redmond salt on all my meals, but I was just drinking filtered water. So I think my, my sodium levels and some of these ratios that the sodium side was down. And that the only way that makes sense is because I'm, I'm just drinking too much of the filtered water and not enough of you know, the mineralized version. So now I'm gonna do another test. So I, uh, I'm doing a podcast about this. So it's gonna take a while because there's gotta be months in between these tests, but we'll see what happens when I drink the, the sole water, just, you know, just even throwing some Redmond salt into my water and now we'll see in my next mineral analysis. And also, I just want to throw in people who can get 15% off at Redmond with my code Sapien, just in case you you know want to try this. I do think, um, I don't know, you probably know better than me, but um, to do a hair analysis, it's, it's months before those minerals really deposit in the hair to get the, the correct result so if you did a hair analysis today it would reflect your mineral yeah. consumption maybe six months ago but not how you improved 
up until well, I don't this know point. if it's six months, but well, um, I, I don't it, know. I don't. Remember. Yeah. It, it, well, I'm gonna do it. I already started drinking more salt in my water and stuff like that. So I'm gonna do one test in another month. So I've already been doing it for a number of weeks, and then I'll do another one later. So maybe this podcast that I'm talking about will take a long time to come out. But yes, I will. Continue It'll be to interesting. Test. You shouldn't make a graph to show how things are improving or changing. That would Absolutely. be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I love this. So but you're hydration. very athletic too. You're very athletic too. Oh. That's another factor that you have to consider in getting good hydration. I mean, you 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 could be sweating a lot of salt. Um, That's exactly what exercise. we talked about because we started recording some of the the first parts of that podcast, and I I just played four hours of beach volleyball in the Texas heat yesterday. So four hours sweating, you know, ninety five degrees. That's going to get out a lot of salt. I also do my sun midday, Texas heat, 40 yeah. minutes in the sun. I'm dripping with sweat. So absolutely. So that's probably that another side is I need to really remineral, mineral, mineralize, hard word to say, uh, with extra sodium. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Maybe even before you exercise, just to have it in your system and maybe after the exercise too, because you, you want to replete or, or um, redeposit all those minerals. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we, we got some food. We got hydration. What's next? The gut microbiome. Oh, mm. how important is the gut? Um, yeah. It's just amazing that it's only being rediscovered in the last, I don't know, five, seven years. Certainly, uh, Hippocrates, I don't remember how many years ago that guy was around, but he said... Mm -hmm basically disease starts in the gut and he knew what he was talking about it's very interesting that we first are made up of about 38 trillion we're made up of about 30 trillion human cells but our gut is the home of about 38 trillion microbes so we have more microbes physically than human cells. So that's an interesting mm -hmm. dynamic that we need to think about. That gut microbiome is critical. It, it helps to generate vitamins. It creates metabolites that do a, a number of things in the body. It also, the metabolites help feed the epithelial barrier of the gut. It actually communicates with the immune system. About 70 or more percent of the immune system cells exist in the gut. Now, 38 trillion bacterial cells and maybe 100 or 200,000 immune cells, um, that's not a very good ratio. But the immune system can't pick up everything, but the microbial community communicates with the immune system to tell it, look here, look there. And the microbial um, system in our body communicates with each other. So the mucous membranes in our mouth and our nose communicate with the, the mucous uh, layers of the gut microbiome. And, and the, the gut tends to become the master control center to the immune system and it tells it where to go to do different things. So it knows exactly what's influencing our body. So that gut microbiome is critical. And your microbiome is as unique to you as your fingerprint. So is that there is no one that can say, you are lacking this specific bacterial species and you must have plenty of it to be healthy. Because for example, if you're familiar with fecal microbial transplants, where they take uh, um, basically fecal material from a very healthy person and put it in a very unhealthy person to change their microbiome in their gut, frequently that person gets healthy. But also frequently, a person can get sicker because mm -hmm. that's not the kind of bacteria they really need or they want, and it fights their system. Your microbiome has evolved and is basically the way it's going to be by the age of two or three. And that microbiome stays with you. 
Now it changes a little bit, but that signature microbiome stays with you. And that signature microbiome in the gut is very similar, not exactly, but similar to the microbiome in the mouth. And here's what's really interesting. That microbiome that talks to the immune system, if it is loaded with pathogenic species because of the diet or a host of other things that can affect the health of the microbiome, that and the immune system can become compromised. It becomes dysfunctional. The epithelial barrier, which is only one cell layer thick, starts to break down. Toxic elements that are natural and normal inside the gut can leak into the bloodstream, creating inflammation. And that inflammation uh, can go into any and every organ system in the body, including the mouth. And when that organs and when that um, chronic systemic inflammation affects the mouth microbiome and the immune system is not functioning at peak performance then the mouth's normal makeup bacteria starts to become pathogenic and when it starts to become pathogenic the dental plaque around the tooth which is healthy until it's not starts to break down and bad food choices start to cause pathogenic ba- or potentially pathogenic bacteria to grow in the mouth. And then you develop gum disease or tooth decay, but it starts in the gut. So the gut health is a critical element. And to correct the gut health, it's a very complicated process. It's not just diet, although that's important. Um, hydrating water, very important. And certainly types of probiotics, especially spore-based probiotics that can generate in the gut because most probiotics, the bacteria are killed in the stomach acid, although their chemical structures that they, they make get through the acid, but they actually are dead. They can't repopulate in the gut, but spore-based probiotics can do that. And that can generate a host of healthy species in the gut. But when that is happening, then the immune system is healthy, there is a healing of the leaky gut, and then basically, if the diet is right, you're not developing gum disease or tooth decay. If it's not, you can develop gum disease or tooth decay. And we can look at um, skeletal remains up to 300,000 years old with intact bone structure, healthy teeth, all 32, 16 on the bottom, 16 on the top, no tooth decay, no gum disease, but dental plaque that has calcified to become tartar in between the teeth. We can see that in skeletal remains. Mm. It's not the bacteria that's a problem. It's the unhealthy overgrowth of bacteria that are the problem. That's super interesting. And I love your phrase, dental plaque is healthy until it's not. And yeah. I love, yeah, looking back at the remains and you know we can see how we've changed and obviously no dentist back then. Guess what, guys? No dentist back then. We didn't really. We didn't have toothbrushes. We didn't have floss. They, they ate a natural diet. They had a good microbiome. And yeah, I mean, actually, I, I spent time with the Hadza, and they did have these little sticks, and they used certain uh, trees, and so they would kind of clean their teeth, and they would do stuff like that. I mean, it's sort of natural to try to get stuff out of your teeth. And uh, but you know, they didn't have toothpaste, and they didn't have mouth washes that have you know antimicrobial. A disinfected mouthwashes and all that stuff. So I've had Dr. Stephen Lin on, who's a, a dentist, who talked about some mm-hmm. of this stuff. Also, uh, Kiran Krishnan, you're talking about the, micro, the microbiome stuff. He's really interesting, and he talks about spore-based probiotics and all that. So I want to let you get more into that because I think a lot of people are, are catching on to this gut thing, gut health, um, gut brain connection, gut mouth connection, gut immune connection. There, yeah. There's so much to it, and yeah, I mean, we're just we're just in the beginning of our knowledge on the gut microbiome, right? But I think we know enough to know it's about your foods. It's about not disinfect, disinfecting the hell out of it, you know, and, and covering yeah. it with, uh, you know, these these sort of just antimicrobial things. Uh, one other thing you mentioned didn't mention, I think, is just, yeah, is just getting out in nature. That affects your microbiome, right? And getting exposure to things like you're talking about soil-based probiotics. I mean, if you were living like a human, you'd be out there getting the soil-based probiotics just by 
not washing your hands and dealing with nature. Yeah, so it's not like soil-based probiotics. Or I, I wouldn't say soil-based, although soil-based is good. Spore, These are I, yeah. spores, which is a little different because I they're do. not. Yeah, they're they're not living. In, they're they're basically um, dormant in the soil. Soil-based are still living in the soil. These spore-based are really dormant. But yeah, I mean, when you're walking on the earth, there are frequencies that are generated into your body. Actually, these are very beneficial. I utilize part of my protocol is pulse electromagnetic field therapy that mimics and 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 um, exacerbates these healthy frequencies to talk among the cells to help their mitochondria produce ATP. This is a very critical element too. But um, yes, spore-based probiotics are not like a man-made supplement. These are the things that our primal ancestors ingested all the time. We didn't wash and sterilize our food. We, we ate wonderful bacteria and it got into our guts. And, and the misnomer that I heard somebody talk about, um, if you have gum disease and you brush your teeth, then all that bacteria you swallow and it gets into your gut and grows. Well, that's not really true for the most part, unless you're a very sick person to start with, because your acid in your stomach is so low, it's like one to two, a pH of one to two. It's our our species was designed, evolved to kill microbes so that we could be um, more carnivore-ish, to eat animal rotting flesh and it wouldn't harm us. We would only get the benefit and the microbes would be destroyed in the gut. This is, I mean, in, in the stomach, this is part of one of our defense mechanisms to, to improve our overall immune system. It's super important. And well, tell us more about, people kind of have it backwards, that they think that tooth health just starts and gum health just starts in your mouth, but you're saying it starts in the gut. Yeah, so even a number of biological dentists will look at the mouth and they understand toxicity and they understand dental materials that could be unhealthy in the mouth and they treat a person's mouth very effectively, yet they see gum disease and they want to kill the bacteria in the mouth because that spreads to everything else in the body. And that's 50% correct, but you don't want to kill all of these bacteria. You want to bring them back into a state of balance. Now, mm -hmm. if there is acute infection, you kill it. But you understand that you're not only killing the good, the bad stuff, you're killing the good stuff. You have to take precautions to rebuild all the good stuff. And it takes many, many more months to rebuild good bacteria than just 10 days of an antibiotic that kills everything. So there are studies. There was a study that was done a year, several years back that showed that 94% of the U.S. population has some form of gum inflammation or bleeding. Mm. You know, bleeding is typically normal, theoretically, when you're brushing or flossing. And that's normal because most people have it, but it's not mm -hmm. healthy. It's not healthy. It is a sign of something going wrong. If you were shaving and you're looking in the mirror or a woman is putting on her makeup, looking in the mirror, and there's a drop of blood that drops out of your ear, you're, um, you're shocked. That should not happen. Yet, if you brush your teeth or floss your teeth or use these little interdental brushes and you get a little bit of bleeding between a couple molars or you spit out your saliva and it's a little pink, you're not concerned about it. And the worst thing is you go to the dental hygienist to get your teeth clean and you, you think that your mouth is healthy and you ask her, um, how does my mouth look? And she'll say, oh, it really looks terrific. You just have a little bleeding in the lower left molar area. If you have a little bleeding, you have infection. It's not like you're a little pregnant. You're not just a little infected. You're infected. Something is wrong. If you take a nail brush and scrub your nails, if, you wouldn't expect the cuticle area to bleed. The gum tissue is as firm and protective as the cuticle around your nail. It is there for a purpose, and it is to protect the space between the gum and the tooth. And the dental plaque 
is a critical element to protect that. Let me diverge for a second because this mm-hmm. is an interesting subject. Think about the human body. This is a question to you. Think about the human body. Is there any place in the human body where a hard structure pierces the skin and embeds itself into sterile tissue? And I'll answer that for you. Mm-hmm. And that is the tooth. And that's it. A Tooth is a hard enamel structure, some other chemicals, but an enamel structure that pierces the gum in the mouth and embeds itself in sterile bone. It is a slick sliding board. If the bacteria in your mouth had nothing to stop it, it would go onto the tooth, slide down the tooth, get into your jawbone. Your bone would necrose. You'll lose your jaw and you'll die. Humans have never had that problem. And the reason is we have an immune system that has created a variety of structures under the gum to protect us from an invasion of an irritant or um, pathogens. But there is a superficial structure that starts the process, and it's a biological film, biofilm, called dental plaque. So dental plaque forms where the tooth and gum meet, and it has three major purposes. It basically includes about two or 300 different species of microbes. And those microbes produce hydrogen peroxide, which is a natural killer in the body that will protect the, the space between the gum and the tooth from invading potentially pathogenic bacteria in the rest of the mouth, in the saliva, for example. So if there's some bacteria in your saliva that want to get onto the tooth and slide down into the jawbone, it has to pass through the dental plaque. And the dental plaque's um, hydrogen peroxide production will kill it, and it can't get through. The other thing that dental plaque does is it has chemical buffers that keep the pH, the acid level, more than 5.5. So if the acid level in the mouth drops to less than 5.5 for a period of time and it touches that acid touches the root of the tooth, you'll get tooth decay. So the dental plaque actually prevents tooth decay because it keeps the acid level around the tooth above 5.5. The other thing is the dental plaque is a gatekeeper. It is the mechanism where minerals from the saliva, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can spread itself through the dental plaque into the root surface to remineralize the tooth as needed. So dental plaque is critical. So all of this is in a state of of homeostasis, but when the gut is dysbiotic, like I mentioned, and you have a leaky gut and chronic systemic inflammation that affects the mouth, the immune system is compromised, the the, the garden of bacteria starts to become pathologic, and then bad food choices feed the growing pathogens in the mouth, especially in the dental plaque. That dental plaque becomes unhealthy. It becomes infectious. And now all of this infectious material can spread under the gum directly into the bloodstream. It can get into the lymph tissues that eventually get into the bloodstream. It can also travel the myelin sheath, the the covering of nerves, almost like a plastic covering for electric wire. It can get onto that, what's called the myelin sheath, and travel throughout the body in that nerve canal. It's amazing how these bacteria, when they're pathogenic, can progress through the rest of the body. And in that sense, an unhealthy mouth creates all kinds of chronic diseases, serious chronic diseases. Mm. But the mouth is on the continuum of the breakdown in the gut. So the gut breaks down, you get chronic systemic inflammation, affects every organ system, and one of those organ systems along this pathway is the mouth. And since the mouth is so obviously easy to understand, if you're a dentist, the dentist can look at the mouth see this damage and say, you've got gum infection. It has caused all these problems. <coughs> Excuse me. But the problems literally started in the gut. They just manifested on this continuum in the mouth and other organ systems. That makes sense to me. Yeah, that was a good recap at the end. It starts in the gut, but then it can go to the mouth, 
and then some things can go down from the mouth. So you, you can see all these right. things and then it does make sense. But what you're saying is they started there. We have to recognize where it started in the gut. Then yes, it could have manifested into worse things going on in the mouth. And then, you know, then you do have these bacteria going to the wrong places. Oh but yeah. People and are that, just, yeah. And, they're not and looking for cycle. Yeah. It's, it's now, there is one caveat and that is if you have poor dentistry in the mouth, broken fillings, bad um, chemicals and in, in filling materials, uh, broken teeth, um, abscesses, whatever that may be causing damage in the teeth themselves because of, again, bad damage, uh, trauma or bad dentistry, that can initiate infection in the mouth before infection in the gut because it's like a splinter in your finger. Stick a splinter in your gum tissue, it's going to get inflamed. It's not because your gut's inflamed. You yeah. just stuck a splinter in your mouth. What the hell, right? You're going to get inflamed. Well, that's the obvious part. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but some people yeah. will misconstrue yeah. what I say and think that I had no, no yeah. idea what I'm talking about because if you had a, you know, had a broken filling, um, you'll get infection in the mouth. And yes, you will, of course. Well, another personal anecdote with me is I've always brushed my teeth consistently from childhood to now, but the only time I had dental problems was in college when I was eating a bad diet. So that was my lowest nutrient density diet. I wasn't getting fat soluble vitamins, vitamins. I was eating processed food, you know, college budget, the whole thing, like just microwaving, whatever. And that's the only time, even though I was brushing my teeth all the time, I still got the dental problems and cavities because I wasn't eating the right foods. And yeah, I mean, Dr. Weston Price found this, you know, 100 years ago, traveling around. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So what, yeah, I guess you've, you've probably kind of covered it, but how do people have good mouth health, good dental health, not get cavities? What can they do? Well, obviously the diet and the gut are important. And certainly the diet needs to, even if you don't want to have a name for the diet, you must avoid toxic elements in the diet. So you don't want to use refined flours. You don't want to use processed sugars. You don't want to eat um, any vegetable or um, uh, seed oils. So these are very, very important. But if you have a healthy mouth, I mean, a, a healthy diet and a healthy gut microbiome. And we can look at our ancestors uh, and skeletal remains. They were not seeing a dentist in a dental cave, like you said earlier. Mm -hmm. They were not getting their teeth painted with fluoride. Um, and they had hardly any tooth decay or gum disease. Now, one could argue, well, the primal ancestors only lived to be 18 years old. This skeletal remain that I have pictures of that is three that is was dated to be three hundred thousand years old had all thirty two teeth in his mouth and it had very severe wear on the chewing surfaces. To me, to, to get all thirty two teeth in the mouth, they, they have an age of maybe eighteen to twenty one, twenty two, and then to get all this wear, it's got to be another four or five years. So this this guy had to be in his middle to late twenties at the youngest so he's not a child um so he lived a good bit and and primal ancestors if they survived to get that old survived death because of infection uh poor birth situations um then they lived to be 60 or 70 years old so it's not our primal ancestors just not didn't live to be just 12 to 18 years old and then all died. Even if that were the case, look at the tooth decay and gum disease in children in elementary school. I mean, huh. yeah. come on, there's something going on here. So, so how do you do it? So you have a healthy diet, you have a healthy gut, and you have to clean your mouth well. Um, there are many, many things that a healthy diet will not do. If you have example, significant emotional stress. You're the healthiest guy in the world or gal in the world. You're eating well. You do everything for your gut. You, you don't, you, or you're control of all, in control of all kinds of toxic influences in your environment, but you are under emotional stress every day, chronic emotional stress. It will literally damage the gut microbiome 
to the point where you can manifest diseases that are severe and significant. I have a series, two slides on a, of a patient that uh, uh, was seen by my partner maybe 15 plus years ago. She came into the office with severe, raw, angry, bubbly looking gum tissue, very ugly. The, he, my partner, the par, a periodontist, looked at her mouth, could not find the etiology, the cause dentally of these lesions. He, he referred her to her physician. They did a bunch of tests. There were no systemic infections or blood discrages. One would think leukemia it wasn't that. They could not find the problem. It turned out that this woman confided in my partner and told him she was being um, emotionally and sexually abused by her employer. Hmm. And she was not married. She lived by herself in in my hometown. And he convinced her to get rid of her job. She actually had a job offer out, out of state. She literally moved and disappeared for four months. When she came back, he took another photograph of her mouth. No lesions whatsoever. No gum, uh, no, uh, gum treatment. No medical treatment. The only thing that changed in her body was that she did not have this constant chronic stress, emotional stress. And my point is that there are so many influential insults to the body that can damage our health. And it's not just good, bad food. And it's not just a bad um, series of uh, things that destroy the, the gut microbiome like we're ingesting. It could be dirty electromagnetic fields. It could be excessive um, 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 reactive oxygen species because of excessive exercise. It could be a lack of exercise. It could be disruption, significant disruption of the circadian rhythm and sleep patterns. There are many, many different factors. Um, Over-the-counter drugs, prescription drugs, there's just so much that can affect the body. But if you can control these elements and start to clean your mouth properly, you're going to be doing well. So how do you clean the mouth? So basically, here's what I recommend. Do you want me to tell you that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so brushing with a soft bristle toothbrush, in my opinion, an electric toothbrush is great at the gum line. Put the bristles into the gum space about 45 degrees. Let the toothbrush do its job on the outside, the cheek side, and the tongue side of the teeth. Um, do that for generally um, these electric brushes have a timer for two minutes, um, and that takes care of it. You'll use dental floss between the teeth basically to remove fibrous material that you're eating, you know, meat fiber, plant fiber, whatever that gets stuck between the teeth at the contact level. Um, but And you can slide the floss slightly down the tooth a little bit. But what you don't want to do is floss under the gum because when you try to floss under the gum, you in uh, literally unintentionally cut the gum. And I've done it in my mouth without even realizing it. And you create a cleft in the gum that will harbor bacteria and, and decaying food particles. So you don't want to floss under the gum, even though every hygienist will tell you that. You don't want to do that. But you'd want to clean in between the teeth, where the teeth meet the gum, by with little um, uh, interproximal cleaners. One of the best brands that I've found is called um, um, TP Easy Picks. They're silicone. They, they kind of bend and recoil to their natural shape. It's like a toothpick, but it's not a toothpick. And you slide it between the teeth, um, rubbing where the gum meets the tooth, and it removes all the excess unhealthy dental plaque, but it leaves the dental film, that, a dental mm -hmm. plaque film that needs to be there. And then you also, <coughs> excuse me, then you'll also want to clean your tongue. And you can take a spoon, invert it, Put it to the back of your tongue, all the way back to your throat area, just and touch the tongue just to the point where you want to gag. Pull the spoon forward, rubbing the gum, uh, uh, the tongue, and you'll see in the bowl of the spoon kind of a whitish liquid accumulate. That is 
decaying food particles and a lot of anaerobic bacteria. If you want to really be gross, take that fluid, put it on the top of your hand, let it dry, take a sniff, and that's what bad breath smells like. And 80% mm -hmm. of our bad breath that we breathe out and offend everybody else by is related to the unhealthy bacteria on the top of the tongue. So if you do those things, you will have a very healthy mouth. Now you can brush with water, salt water. You can brush with a little bit of baking soda that actually will help to remove stain on the surface of the tooth. And in addition, because it is neutral, it will um, um, neutralize the acidity in the mouth if there is acidity for one reason or another. So that works well. You can use a toothpaste, one of the toothpaste and commercial toothpaste that are very that's very holistic and, and has ingredients that I use personally. It's called Revitin, R-E-V-I-T-I-N. You can get that online if that was something interesting. And what's even inter more interesting, and I wrote a paper about that a couple months ago, um, is that Manuka honey is phenomenal as a toothpaste. Now, I got a lot of uh, kickback from a lot of people saying I'm a quack and I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to cause people to get tooth decay. But if you read the cited literature, uh, peer review literature, you will see that honey, especially Manuka honey, does destroy pathogenic bacteria causing gum disease and tooth decay. It's been used for years and years and years. There are so many studies that show that it is very healing and effective in the mouth and it will not cause tooth decay if it's used properly. That's super interesting, very counterintuitive to some, but it makes sense if you know how the body works. And yeah, like I said, it's it. I think tooth decay and kind of what you're saying is it starts way deeper in your diet and in your, your gut and not just on your teeth. I think there was an anecdote from Weston Price where he found people that were chewing on sugarcane all day, but they had fine dental health. So it kind of disproves that idea because they had good health overall and then they could chew on sugarcane and they were protected theoretically from the cavities because of their good diet and fat soluble vitamins. There is an interesting story, a paper that was written um, about the Hadza. And as you know, the Hadza love honey and the women in, in, in the town area or wh wherever the living quarters were eating honey had minimal tooth decay, um, gum pro minimal gum problem, minimal tooth decay, but the hunters that left for a long period of time were eating honey and they developed tooth decay. Well, it's very interesting in the paper, it's kind of like a side note, but I think it's very critical. When they were eating honey in, in their hunting, um, they were chewing on the, um, the beeswax, the, the honeycomb. And the honeycomb is very sticky. And they would chew it, and they would be doing it for days on out. And the stickiness concentrated between the teeth and concentrated the sugars for extended period of times. And now the sugar of the honey was now doing what unfortunately sugar does, and it created a food for overgrowth of bad bacteria. So that's where the, I think the decay came from when the hunter, the Hadza hunters were actually getting decay, but they were chewing the, mm. um, interesting. Yeah. So do you have any other, uh, tips for people who maybe they do have that, that bacteria on their tongue? How do you get rid of it? Because you don't want to use the antimicrobial mouthwashes, I'm guessing. You don't want to, you don't want to get rid of it. And let me tell you why <clears throat> the anaerobic bacteria in the tongue are part of a very important nitrate, nitric, nitrate, nitrite, nitric oxide pathway. So in your saliva, you have biologically active nitrates from foods or whatever you've eaten. Those nitrates, and they're concentrated in the sal salivary gland, so they're pouring in your saliva 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Those nitrates are acted upon by the anaerobic bacteria in your tongue to produce nitrite. That nitrite, you 
inadvertently swallow. You normally swallow a number of times a minute. That's natural. You'll swallow the nitrites and it will get into your gut and circulatory systems and it will eventually be broken down to a variety of products including nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is a critical element for cardiovascular health and blood pressure control. And there was a paper that was written by a bunch of cardiologists, I would say maybe five years ago, that that was written by cardiologists for cardiologists. And it basically said, if you're treating your patients with high blood pressure medication, and you weren't getting the results that you thought you needed to get, make sure that they are not using an antimicrobial mouthwash to kill the bacteria, the natural bacteria, especially those anaerobic bacteria on the base of your tongue, because it eliminated the pathway of of nitric oxide Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the nitrates never were reduced to nitrate, therefore it couldn't get to the state of nitric oxide, and their blood pressures were going up. And if you did not eliminate those bacteria, the blood pressure would regain to a more normal level. So it's a very critical pathway. That anaerobic bacteria is critical, but in its proper state, not overgrown and pathogenic. That's why the spoon just removes the superficial pathogenic layer, and it doesn't remove the other layers. And um, that's where the bad odors come from, the superficial layer. Okay, so yeah, so tongue scrapers, something like that. Will yeah, help. Or, or yeah, is, or a spoon, even just spoon. Yeah. Are you saying is the easiest? Is there anything else that people, if they change their diet, should theoretically those sp- different sure. species get better so it doesn't smell bad? Sure. So a lot of odor can also come from the stomach. So if you're eating certain foods and they are they have a lot of sulfur in the foods, those foods can come off of the stomach directly or when you're metabolizing them and gets into your bloodstream and it's blown off through your lungs that can create odor so some of the foods that you're eating will have an odor um, that you can't change because it's already part of your digestive system now you could also chew on mint leaves or things like that that give maybe a fresher taste to your mouth and there's nothing wrong with that All right. Well, those are good tips. Now that um, you brought up honey as sort of this last topic before we go, I want to circle back on that. You said you include it in your diet, and I know you kind of cycle in some berries and some other carb sources, stuff like that, sure. every once in a while. So how do you do that? So I try, again, um, I try to improve my immune system because not only I know that I need to do that, but the 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 initial reason was I wanted to help my cancer healing. So my thought is, and from the research I've read, and certainly the Paleo Medicina Clinic, is that we want to be in ketosis. We want to have ketone bodies produced in our bloodstream that do a number of beneficial things. It enhances endogenous production of glutathione, which is critical. It also in, it reduces free radical um, concentration. It improves the mitochondria and the production of ATP. And it is a clean burning fuel. It gets to the brain. The brain needs about um, 80% or can use about 70 to 80% of its fuel needs from actual ketones. So it's a very, very good fuel. And, I, and I, if I'm doing that and, and burning fat, only, then I can be um, basically skinny and healthy with no Mm -hmm. loss of of, uh, muscle meat, uh, muscle tissue. So I do that approximately five to six days a week. So I'm eating less than 20 to 25 grams of carbs a day. And then I want to exercise my body's ability to metabolize the other fuel which is carbohydrates. And to get enough carbohydrates to stop ketosis, I need to get in uh, certainly above 
30 or 40 grams of carbs a day, but I'll get into the 100, 150 grams or so of carbs a day. And then I switch off ketosis and I know I'm out of ketosis because I use a breath ketone meter all the time. So I'm out of ketosis. My body is functioning like it should. Insulin levels go up. It's creating um, significant, healthy, uh, low glycemic variability. I'm metabolizing the carbohydrate or the glucose correctly. And then I switch back for the next five or so days to a fat burner going into ketosis. Um, honey, which is very interesting, Manuka honey, one tablespoon, which is <coughs> a lot of honey, one tablespoon only has 12 grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's nothing. So if I eat a tablespoon of honey, and I'll not do that at one sitting, so I may eat half a teaspoon here and a half a teaspoon there and it's definitely not coming to a, a tablespoon a day i can stay in ketosis and i know i'm getting ketosis because my breath ketone meters keeps me in ketosis mm -hmm. so i can enjoy honey and still be a fat burner but if i were to have three tablespoons of uh, honey a day i will kick out of ketosis or if i have a little bit of honey and maybe some fruit and an avocado and all of a sudden, my carbs go up to 100, 150 grams, then I'm definitely a carb burner for that day or two. But the beautiful thing is I'm metabolically flexible. My body knows how to move from a fat burner to a carb burner to a fat burner. So when I go back into ketosis, not having the carbohydrates, I don't have cravings. Now, in those days it, it passed, you know, I was eating pizza. I was, eat, I mean, I was, I love carbs. And as soon as I didn't have my carbs, I starved and had to have more carbs. There's mm -hmm. no cravings. I have no cravings. That's great. Yeah. I found the same. Uh, there, there's a big difference between your carb sources. And I love metabolic flexibility. Uh, I think I've been talking about it since day one, really, when I started doing all my stuff four years ago. And well, I mean, I started before that, but I started putting out content four years ago, I think, and uh, super important. And I, yeah, I've seen problems when people just, they're just going keto for years and years at a time. And I don't think that's natural. I don't think that's what well, I don't think it's natural. I, I, yeah. our, our ancestors didn't do it. We, we are omnivores. We are not carnivores. We are not meant to eat a carnivore diet 100% all the time. We have eaten and our guts are designed for some plant matter, but not plant matter in large proportions and certainly not plant matter that have anti-nutrients that damage our gut. It's a great little wrap up there. I love it. We're really on the same page. It's, you know, I mean, sapien diet. I'm trying to just say what people <coughs> are already doing. You know, I just don't like the word carnivore. I don't associate myself or identify as a carnivore. I mean, to me, that's just an unnatural diet that maybe people can use it for a short time. And I don't, I don't know. I just don't like people going around. Oh, carnivore. I'm carnivore. This is a carnivore. It's like, no, we, we humans are omnivores. We subsist on all types of food all over the world. And if you're doing it correctly in my book, it's called sapien where yes, you are eating, like you said, 80 to 90% of your foods are from animal foods and you have key low anti-nutrient plant foods and you can cycle it in, you can eat seasonally, you can mix it up, and and everything seems to work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like people that are not vegans may say they're plant-based. Well, they are plant-based 80 to 90% of the time, but they eat some meat. So I'm saying I am animal-based. I will eat meat, and of course, desiccated organs are critical, collagenous material, saturated fat are critical, but all those elements, is part all uh, all those elements are a part of my um, my animal based diet, but ten percent are some of those plants that are free of or minimally um, involved with anti nutrients, and I exactly. think that's a critical part for our immune system because the bottom line here is like I mentioned earlier, we need to build and recreate a robust immune system, which most people, and when I say most, it's over 90 to 95%, I'm sure, most people um, that you and I communicate with or in the world of the United States and westernized civilizations, 
Most of these people are not metabolically flexible. They are immune compromised and any and all viruses, not to mention or name any one, are going to be more virulent than it should be because we don't have the mechanisms, the army, to fight the battle that it is intended to fight. A hundred percent. And I'll do my last anecdote of the day is that everyone I know, I'm friends with, we'll call it a hundred people in the like ancestral health <clears throat> community, whatever kind of community you want to call it. And all of these people do the things we talked about this entire episode. They don't eat a lot of processed foods. They eat pretty much animal based diets. They get sleep. They do the sun. They do the nature. They do all the things we're talking about and not one of them has had a problem with the current viral disease. Not one of them. Some people have gotten it asymptomatic. Some people got it. Oh, 24 hours. I felt kind of slow. The worst thing I heard was, you know, three days. I felt kind of bad, but yeah. I don't know if it's a coincidence. Maybe this is beyond anecdote at this point, because I know it goes beyond the hundred people that I personally am friends with. There are thousands of people that I communicate with on social media. And just, this is my take. My anecdotal take is that these people doing all these things do have the good immune system. They they are the the few, the proud, the metabolically flexible. These are the people that are are doing things right. They have the good immune health. And guess what? A virus comes their way and it bounces off them. We fight it. It's been done for the last two and a half million years. This is part of the way our species evolved, and that's the reason why we are alive today, because we have an immune system that fights. It's almost too sensical. It's It, it makes too much yeah. sense. You're crazy. Yeah. You're crazy. Yeah. All right. I know. Thank you so much. Where can we find you? Because I know you have a great blog. You have the 10 <clears throat> unconventional cancer. Um, what is it? Protocols. Cancer protocols. protocols. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. My uh, website is drdannenberg.com, D-R. D-A-N-E-N-B-E-R-G. Uh, lots and lots of blog stuff that you can download. Um, in addition, I do some coaching, individual coaching, looking at their diet, their gut, their dental health, and all interrelated. I do hour coaching, and also I do 12-week um, metabolic coaching. I've written a couple of mini eBooks. One called "The Better Belly Blueprint" to compete with you, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> your sapien diet. But it's basically mm -hmm. my concept, and then um, uh, very, very similar. And then I have another more intense type of book. Uh, again, it's a mini eBook called "Is Your Gut Killing You," which goes into a lot of detail with over 295 cited medical papers that specifically show. Our environment disrupt, disrupting our gut microbiome, affecting our mouth, and then the vicious cycle that uh, progresses throughout the entire organ systems of our body. I love it. Check it all out. Actually, people have been sending me your work for over a year now, so it's good to finally <laughs> finally connect. I've been following along slowly, and you know, it's finally time uh, to connect well, and do this podcast. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, everything everything is meant to be, right? Yes. I mean, it's all, it's, it's life journey and, you know, things have come along my way recently and everything I feel like is meant to be. Everything's yeah. going well and I'm glad I connected with you and thanks for the, the great interview and uh, we'll see you. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care, Brian. Okay. You too. And that's it. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for sharing with a friend, giving a review on the iTunes or podcast app. Getting all your meat at nosetail.org delivered to you. We got the biltong, the seasonings, body care, and the fresh meat. Also, saping.org. Go there, join the newsletter, join the program if you want to lose weight and get healthy with Dr. Gary and the tribe for all the bonus features, private Zoom calls, show notes, private community. That's the tribe at saping.org. All right, guys, I'll see you next week.